Hello. Today I'd like to welcome to the Smarter Building podcast a lady with a wealth of knowledge in offsite construction, who until very recently led industrialized construction strategy and enterprise transformation at Autodesk, and has spoken on these topics at prominent events around the globe. We're delighted to welcome Amy Marks, uh, also known as the Queen of Prefab. Hi, Amy. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Very good. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out we we only met for the first time last week, but with um, offsite construction such a hot topic for positive and negative reasons in the UK, um, it made sense to get you on as quickly as possible to share your knowledge and um, and, what knowledge from around the globe, as we found out last week, that you have a quite an interest in the UK uh, modular construction market and um, beyond that. So it'd be great just to have a chat with you and get some of your insights. I'm really looking forward to it. It's great. So thank you for having me on. Really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, to start with, could we just get a bit of back of your background and explain how you become such an expert in this sector, please? Sure. I'm happy to. Um, so I actually started out in conventional construction. I uh, ended up buying a 75-year-old company that did steel and concrete volumetric mods as well as bathroom pods everywhere around the world. So we did things like data centers and embassies and hotels and schools, you name it. Uh, it was sort of like it did everything, this particular company. So I I actually rose up um, from several positions there to be the president there. And um, I actually now own the intellectual property from that company, but left that company and started a consultancy, first of its kind around industrialized construction and optimizing the use of prefabrication. So that sounds like a normal thing now, but back then, back in the day, I would say, I think a couple of my friends laughed and uh, certainly a bunch of people laughed and uh, started that consultancy, ended up working for guys like all around the world from semiconductor to governments to big data center companies, uh, big high rise business and things like that. So, and all along kept building kind of had a, a, a part of our business, not kind of, we had a part of our business that actually continued to build prefabricated data centers throughout. And um, and then, you know, Autodesk and I came together and ended up going over to Autodesk. Um, I feel really happy about all the work I did over there with manufacturing informed design and industrialized construction over there, including the incubation that uh, is now run by Andrew Anagnos, the CEO. And just recently I came over to Symmetry as the executive vice president of global strategy. So super excited about that and uh, hoping hoping to have a great time here serving more customers in a more meaningful way. How did uh, the, the big corporate Autodesk environment compare coming from a background of running your own, your own businesses? How was that? I feel, I feel like that's a trick question all of a sudden. No, it's, uh, it's definitely different. I mean, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you were in control of your own destiny at all times. You're able to be agile and get things done. And feedback loop with customers is very quick. I think, you know, moving over to Autodesk, um, you know, again, like I, I, when I went there, there wasn't a conversation about the platform at the time. And, um, you know, quickly, you know, that became sort of one of the flags I carried around. How do we break down silos and cross industry workflows? Because, you know, I run into that myself and also a lot of the customers. So it was definitely different for me. I think, um, you know, the culture of symmetry, I think is different than that now. So, you know, that's my hope in coming to symmetry to work a little faster, a little bit, you know, again, like I, I'm face to face with customers all the time. Um, but I want to work with customers from the very smallest to the very largest, like I do now. And I think, I think that's often hard at a very large company. You kind of get pigeonholed into working with, for me, at least the biggest of the big customers and, you know, I, I would always find time for every, uh, you know, small mechanical contracting firm around the world. And that was just, it became a passion, I think, instead of my job every day. So, you know, that's important for, for me. Fantastic. And to, today we're going to speak about um, prefab or uh, modular construction or industrialized construction, talk about modern methods of construction, design for DFMA, all that kind of stuff. What Should we start with a bit of a description and background for people like myself who get confused and lost in all this language as to what means what that'd be great sure i i'm partly to blame i think for all of these uh words and things that people get confused about i mean i've been in this space for a couple decades now and really part of my role initially was to set the level you know level set the language i would say there's definitely some localization to the language you know how we talk about it in asia is a slightly different you know, than how we talk about it in, in the UK, how it's talked about slightly different in the US. But overarching, for me, what I uh, use now, 
um, is the term industrialized construction and applying things like, you know, manufacturing techniques and sustainable practices to bring scale to the way in which we're able to build design and build things. So for me, it's really important that sort of the umbrella I use right now is industrialized construction. I know that in the UK, a lot of people say MMC, modern methods of construction. I got to be honest, I'm in my 50s. The minute I say modern, I feel like it's old the second it comes out of my mouth. So like, it's very hard for me, you know, uh, to say MMC anymore. It just feels, it feels like old, right? It's uh, it's like turn of the century almost, you kind of say. But um, so I, I would say umbrella wise, you know, I, I tend to use industrialized construction. And then, you know, there are both technology and process enablers underneath that umbrella. So there's things like building information modeling and manufacturing informed design and things like IoT and big data. All of that is sort you know at the at the foundation of making this happen. Um, lean manufacturing. I'm also a big believer and trained in lean manufacturing techniques. And then I think like at, at, as you level up, you're sort of thinking about the physical manifestation. Most people get that confused with the methodology. So they'll say modular, but in reality, that's just a kind of component, right? So it, for me, it always started with advanced building products, things that, you know, reduce drying time or welding time or hot work, things like, you know, things like the tolic piping or, um, you know, uh, pro press, if you will, Nipco fittings, anything that was, you could actually take from the manufacturer and in, integrate quickly on site. Then single trade assemblies, multi trade assemblies, and then ultimately volumetric mods like modular. So when people say modular to me, I'm not sure if they mean like volumetric mods that stack and are the structure of the building. And they tend to use it sort of interchangeably with everything else. And I, I've always said like, you know, that's a very specific type of prefab, um, if you will. And I think it's changing now. I think, I think people are recognizing that the assemblies are really what is sort of been going on around the world behind the scenes and getting and getting not as much attention as the volumetric mods but you know overarchingly i think that continuum of elements is what people try to put words to and the, and what i would call the prefab prefabrication continuum or the pieces and parts but um yeah I, I try to level set it by the way every show that i go to i always show one slide and i go through all the language cuz i know look in singapore they call it ppvc in UK, they're calling it, you know, MMC, or they'll say, you know, my friends at Langer Work will say design for manufacture and assembly as if it means the whole process, like including like the way it's built. And I always thought like, you know, DFMA design for manufacturing and assembly is more like a, a, a methodology for design, you know, the way it is in manufacturing. It's not the whole thing. You know what I mean? Yep. I th How is that? Does that help you out a little I bit? I think I'm more confused <laughs> or less confused. I, I know at least now where you're coming from it at it from. So that probably helps me and everyone else. But um, yeah, probably needs sure. a, a bit more consistency in the in the world, I guess, if we're going to keep using this language, it'd be really useful to, to at least be consistent across the globe. I think so. You know, funny about it, 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 it when I went to the US, my, my name and my company was Excite. Like I love the term offsite at the time. It, it, it doesn't, it's evolved. There's so much prefabrication and uh, manufacturing done on site these days that you can't really call the whole thing as off site anymore. So I think it's just these things evolve. If you only have one, line, look, I mean, this was never called my smartphone when it first came out. You know, it was something else, it was my cell phone. I think if you're not thinking about how language evolves over time, you're just stuck in the old, right? Like you have, it has to evolve over time. Even the like, look, I don't love industrialized construction sometimes because the designers feel like it cuts them out. You know what I mean? So I'm always like, no, no, that includes you. So I'm sure my language will evolve over time if we're learning and growing all the time. Okay. So industrialized construction, where where's the, the biggest op, uh, opportunity for this um, to be adopted more widely? Where is it being adopted well and where could it be adopted better? You know, it's funny. I think it's a very unsung hero, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, the services contractors, as you would call it in the UK, like all the services. For over two decades, the majority of the, the industrialized construction, the prefabrication that work that's been done has been below ground, above the ceilings, I would say behind the walls. And, you know, they're sort of, they don't get a lot of attention. And reality is, that and structure, you know, are where the majority of, of industrialized construction is happening every day. So like I had a friend actually like recently look over a city and he was like, you know, I don't see much prefabrication happening when I look out in this big city. 
And I was like, well, I mean, you're what you think you are saying is he didn't see a lot of boxes being stacked on boxes. And I would say there's not a building in this city being built right now that is not getting services assemblies from another factory fabrication facility, not in this city or adjacent to the somewhere, you know, not at the site. So I, I just think we have to retrain our brains. And, and that way, when things happen, when it's, you know, especially what's going on in the UK with volumetric mods, uh, and there's a glitch, let's say, you don't sort of chuck everything, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we say here in the, in the US. But, but no matter what happens in life, I would say these days, the services assemblies have been going on for several decades and continue to grow in, in popularity um, on every job. So you, you mentioned the, the UK glitch. Um, we, yeah, we probably see it as a, what do we describe? What was it described as the other day? The modular construction catastrophe. I think I saw it written somewhere. So, but you know, Mods, glit Mods no, glitch I, is a bit, uh, is, is a nice way to put it, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they're wrong, actually, in what they're saying. I think it has been a catastrophe, if you really want to know. Um, we, 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 fair word. Yeah, we sort of chatted on that last week a little bit. Yeah, so do you want to dive into that a bit further? Yeah, I mean, look, it's so funny. It's like, what question do you actually ask when somebody says modular catastrophe, right? I think... Here, here, here's the, here's my basic feelings about it. And by the way, my feelings and anything that I say as a thought leader in the space and influencer are my thoughts. By the way, I always say that in order to be a thought leader, you have to have your own thoughts. You can't just spit out the thoughts of the company that you work for. So for a very long time, I have felt that housing and government is not necessarily the way you should start. If you really want industrialized construction to be prolific, right? So it seems in every... Because again, those boxes are very sexy to put on the front page of the papers or whatever, or to talk about. And also housing is, you know, one of those topics like who doesn't want more housing? It's like, basically when you talk about these things, it's like, who doesn't want puppies and babies? Like everybody likes puppies and babies. We all like puppies and babies. Is that the way to get this done? I never thought it was. You know, I've, I've said that outright in many interviews that I don't think if you're trying in any country to get more infrastructure built, the place that you should spend your money on is not in, you know, the 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 modular uh, volumetric spaces where we may have seen, you know, not necessarily some of the most uh, sophisticated buildings come out of those shops, right? So if you look at again, if you look at somebody like, let's say Mercury in the in in, in Ireland over there, they're doing cr unbelievable prefabrication as an example for services for things like semiconductor and data centers and things like that. And yet, like, we don't really go to them to say, how do we build more infrastructure? We go to, you know, a, a house builder that's building these big boxes that doesn't necessarily even have heavy MEP experience or heavy complicated construction experience. And we're somehow expecting those teams to figure out how to manufacture in the most advanced ways. So I always thought it was like tail wagging dog. And I, I really feel like when you get a bunch of architects in a room and you ask them how to best manufacture things, I like would always like I would scratch my head and be like, where are the manufacturers in this room? Like, you know, you get a bunch of architects in a room and you ask them how to manufacture things and it's as if manufacturing doesn't exist. And I think that unfortunately the program there has been set up because of that with some failures that um, are getting a lot of attention. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is failing. I think I think that people in this space, when they hear one construction project in modular fails, it's like all modular is failure. You know, it's like I can I can point to a million construction projects that have gone bust across the world that nobody says we should never construct buildings anymore. And it's like, wait, well, hold on a minute. So I get it. I'm not saying you know no one is successful, but it's not the way in which I just recently consulted with a government down in Australasia, and I was like, I don't think the way that you know, um, the UK has actually handled it and moving forward is the right way. Um, I think I think Singapore has done some great things. And I know my friends in Singapore have gone over to learn from what's going on in the UK so that they don't repeat those things. I think they've put a lot more attention on the technology and manufacturing and the incentives that are there for bigger companies and creating innovation hubs. I just, you know, for me, it's like, uh, and it's very unfortunate when you've been in the space a long time and you see a car crash coming from 30,000 feet away or in your case, kilometers away, you can't actually stop it, but you see it happening and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And you just kind of hope for the best. And I think, you know, unfortunately that's where we're at now um, in the UK with some of, with some of the stuff going on. So you mentioned Singapore. Is there anywhere else that you think uh, are getting this right? And, you know, the guys from Singapore are coming to learn what not to do. Where should the guys from UK be going to, uh, to take inspiration? 
You know, it's so funny. I don't think they should go to the construction space at all, almost. That's the thing. You know, like I would say if you look into what some of the best, again, the services guys are getting it right and some of the the more automated structure, you know, companies, the guys that are taking real manufacturing technique techniques to the structure of buildings. And again, not volumetric necessarily, but like to actual panels, to wall panels and things like that. I think, yes, take a little look there, but then you have to look at how things are actually being manufactured, right? You have to go into places to understand how robotics works. And again, our, our issue is that, you know, and this is, I think, the one of the biggest problems when I went and spoke again during a time at the UK, you know, it was like, they just wanted to keep things very performance-based, like, and very, I would say, like gray in the in the in the perspective of you know when they talk about the platform is like well as as long as you kind of squint your eyes could meet this maybe you can bid on these types of projects if you make this kind of type assembly and it was like what wait a minute you know like if you actually want to manufacture things you have to have products I think like everyone kind of forgets that like they don't go like. You know, if you look at any other place in the world, if you're looking at a big hospital, they're like putting out bids for like actual product. They don't go, well, kind of something sort of like a bed, you know, maybe if it, I mean, we, the problem is you can't really apply all these great manufacturing techniques if you don't have products, right? And so because architects feel it's their place to design, I would say assumption-based design areas where they're not necessarily specking product because they're trying to, it's like they want to keep it open for bid and yet they want certainty at the same time. And it's like, unfortunately, those two things don't go together. Right. It's like you, you actually have to specify something in real, uh, like what it actually is, not what it could be or not the assumption that you think it could. You know, it's like and that that's really the gist of it is we're getting we should go look to other industries to see how things are being done, um, because, again, assumption based design has ruled the world. And that's why estimates happen. And that's why these crises happen. And that's why things don't fit together, because you have all this iterative process when things don't start out as real things. Right. It's like I, I, I'm, I'm constantly perplexed by that. Why we keep we like act the same way and we think we're going to have dramatically different results somehow. Do you think, right. Yeah. Like that doesn't make do sense. Do you think the client has a responsibility to try and ask for something that exists rather than, you know, want, wanting the moon on a stick and uh, and it to be modularly constructed at the same time, you know? Yeah, I mean, look, we're in a really difficult situation at the moment right now in construction. We're a 14 trillion dollar ecosystem that has yet to be connected by e-commerce in a major way. I'm not going to say there aren't amazing things like Cope AI or friends of mine. They're great. They're in the UK. They have like a, you know, a small marketplace they've started, but that's not certainly not a global marketplace of pieces and parts and equipment. Uh, we are the only place in the world that if you're looking to go design something, you would have to get out of your tools to go find something else and hope that you could find it in a format that you could somehow bring it back into the thing you're working on. Like, it just doesn't exist right now, right? There are all these mini marketplaces setting up, but in reality, like I can go on my iPhone right now and look for something on amazon.com or Ariba or Alibaba, and I could search parameters and I could find in real time, real things that would be able to be, you know, strung together. You know, I, I always say I'm searching for shoes, but it'll tell me like, you should buy these pants, this shirt and these socks with those shoes. Like we actually have that going on where I see both, you know, I see manufacturers, resellers and distributors all in the same place. Um, we don't have that, right? So it's like, we're sort of expecting like, well, do you think our owners should ask for real things? And I'm like, sure. The answer is of course, but is there a place where they can find those real things? Like where they can spec like real things where people can then design with those real things. And I think you're seeing that happen, right? So like, if you look at anyone that has skin in the game where they have to build 30 data centers or 50 hospitals or 20 manufacturing facilities, they've sort of put a stop to this. And they said, hey, this is the thing you have to design with no matter what from these assemblies, like look at anything in pharma, anything in data centers, anything in semiconductor, you're seeing a shift of having like, you know, sort of, I would say regular buildings are like 5% of actual known things and 95% of assumption. And you see in the guys, they're shifting. It's like 45% of known things to like, you know, now 55%. And you're seeing that like slowly shift. Why? Because there's so much more money if you can get the 30 data centers up and then fighting with some contractor on, you know, $7 cheaper tile. You know what I mean? Like these guys are really starting to take control, but yeah, of course it's their responsibility, but we have to have to give them some tools. And I think you've got to be able to, if they give you what you want to use, you've got to be able to string it together from the time they say, I want to use this to the time that you're getting it, you know, in a digital twin to see it perform, right? Like that's on us that we haven't, and I don't mean us as in symmetry. I mean us as in an ecosystem. You know, we have to connect the 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 silos, right? Okay. 
So quite comprehensively, you're giving reasons here that have nothing to do with economy, lack of finance, anything like that, which is quite often what's played out as being the challenges and the reason for it not being successful uh, in the UK. Right. So it's um, really interesting. Do you think the economy and market conditions had anything to do with it? Or is that just an excuse that's always going to be there? Look, that's a great question. If you don't have a good business and the economy like has an issue, like you're not going to be in business. If you have a great resilient business, I don't care what the interest rates are, you're going to have a resilient business. There are plenty of businesses right now that are very resilient because of the technology that they've implemented, because they've moved past like having to you know, rely on the domain expertise that lives in people's brains. Like, you're, I mean, it's like kind of, I don't want to say like silly to think the interest rates and like what's going on in global economies don't affect it. Of course it does. But, you know, if you're not thinking about that as a provider of any of these either services or components, and you haven't thought, look, digital transformation makes your business more resilient. You, you just, everyone has to understand that. You know that, right? Like the whole conversation about, and again, like the solution of common data environment, I don't mean ISO 19650, but just common data environment as a way in which you share and collaborate on information at your company and your stakeholders and your customers. If you're not looking at common data environment and you're not figuring out how to, um, you know, not just, I always say like uh, when we're productizing things, it's not just the assembly. You productize both the physical, but many have never productized the digital workflow like if you've just stopped at the at the component part, you are not resilient. If you can't figure out from start to finish how to make that, let's call it electrical room or that pump or the you know distribution rack multi trade. If you don't know how to make it from the physical and its parameters, and you don't understand how from concepts all the way through tracking it through digital twins, if you don't know exactly the right tools and the right behaviors with your stakeholders, you don't really have much. You just have a construction company under a roof, or you're just hoping that the economy stays well enough that you can, you know, build some things in the same way you've been building them every single day. So like, you know, like, I don't want to say it's a silly question because it's a great question because everyone blames the economy for the reason these businesses are going out of business. And again, like there will always be a certain percentage of businesses that fall out when there are times of trouble. But like, there are also a lot of businesses that are doing very great, like good things in their processes that will be resilient through these times and actually prosper. And, and, and by the way, a lot of the MEP guys have actually prospered in a lot of these times that have implemented real manufacturing techniques because you still need hospitals. We still need data centers. You still need buildings. People still need a place to live and and certainly infrastructure. So it's like, I don't know. It just seems like an easy answer to say like, this is why this failed. And it's like, well, is it? Is that the only, I don't actually think that's the only reason it's failed. I think that's, that's more like a pressure that if you're not set up for success, you will fail. If yep. you're not ready for that, you will fail. But blaming it is doesn't seem the right answer for me. Okay. You've mentioned uh, governments and the wider ecosystem a couple of times. What do you think needs to happen to facilitate more, better industrialized construction? Who who needs to be driving it and what can we do better as an ecosystem? I mean, I try to like, although my nickname is the queen of prefab, just do better construction as you know an ecosystem. And yes, industrialized construction is a part of that. Understanding the you know sustainability issues that are going on. How do you understand how you're designing a building with you know responsibility for carbon and things like that? That's a big deal too. I think the bigger, broader question is that any of these methodologies, whether it's you know understanding and tracking embodied and operational carbon, or you know designing things so that they can be manufactured in standard ways, all of these things are the government. If you're building with government money, you know, if you're giving out money from the government, you should be understanding what is enabling this. And currently, the only thing most governments have really talked about is BIM standards. And I would say that that's not going to get you where you want to go. If you walk into any room and you ask any group of contractors, how many of you have had a BIM model you can't build from? Out of 100 contractors, 100 contractors will raise their hand and say, I have had many a, a, a BIM model that I cannot build from, right? So... If you're wondering like why we put so much pressure on BIM standards and still we're getting models that you can't build from, then you have to start thinking bigger, right? You have to start thinking about data standards. You have to start thinking about like from the universe of what you own as a government or what you're putting money into, how many things do you actually understand the performance of the things that are being specified over time so that you can start taking more control over what it is you want your buildings or your hospitals or your, your housing designed with? So I would just like, let's start there. When you think about $100 a government spends, 
41% of that $100 is spent in transactional waste. 41%. Now I'm government. Once we get our transactions and we go through all these iterative design processes of like assumption-based design down to real things, after we figure out what it is we're building, 30 to 40% of the materials we specified are ending up in the landfills. I would say the first step government has to take is what responsibility do you play in one, wasting the money on processes that are actually iterative in nature and assumption based? And two, like our landfills are filled with the garbage based on the assumption based design that's happening. And as a government, that should be very important to you. Um, I, I think, funny enough, if you focus on the practices that would eliminate that from happening, you would actually get more housing, you would get more hospitals, you would get more data centers, and you would have more responsibly designed buildings when it comes to carbon and sustainable outcomes, right? So you've got to first recognize that there's, I always say, you have to recognize first there's a problem and that you're dissatisfied with that problem um, if you're government. Well, you did say we should just do better construction, which maybe means we shouldn't wait for the government. You know, they're not always the quickest to move on these things. Um, and as an ecosystem, clients do want better data quality now. Gone are the days where they took the Revit model and throw it in the cupboard. They're actually trying to utilize it, as you say, data center providers and people like that. So should we be ignoring government and cracking on in terms of improving the construction process? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in in capitalism, if you will, you know, like I always say, like as an American, probably that makes sense. You know, I've, I've grown up here. I think, look, when we use the phrases about government, it's because they're really a serial owner, right? Like they own a lot of things. They spend a lot of money and they have the purse strings for a lot of things. So do a lot of other big companies that need to take control of these. And they are, by the way. So people like we mentioned, big data center owners, big hospital um, developers, um, big manufacturers, the car, you know, the car manufacturers and even the big pharma. Every single one of them has taken, I would say, a move towards trying to understand uh, how to design with certainty, right? So how do we think about what it is that the, that the that the designers, instead of just giving them a blank sheet of paper, you know, they're or or a blank screen, I should say these days, you know, they're giving them the the equipment, if you will, the assemblies, if you will, the processes, if you will that are approved by them that they are seeing consistent performance over by supply chain partners across markets, right? So if you're a data center provider, you're looking at you know power and cooling and partners in that why, because it costs you a lot to build it and it costs a lot operationally over time, you know, energy efficiency and operationalized carbon. So they are paying more attention to that, I would say, the ones that are in it for the long game, right? That are looking to serve more patients, have a portfolio of projects, not necessarily the owners that are flipping buildings necessarily that don't care. But I would say there's a lot of responsibility on those serial owners to take control and understand, you know, what it is that they're specifying and giving them as almost like a kit of parts, a wish list, if you will, of, you know, how architects need to design their buildings. And, you know, that's that's been happening. That's not a new thing. You know, like there are definitely like owner furnished, we call them, or free issue in whatever country you're in. There just needs to be more of that, right? So where they're doing more studies in advance to understand tracking these assemblies, how are they performing, under what circumstances. And, you know, Digital Twin is a big part of that. I think we pay way too much attention only to asset twins. I mean, if you're a data center owner these days, one day soon, you're going to want an environmental twin. I mean, look at what NVIDIA is doing on their environmental digital twin side, but you're going to want an environmental twin. You're going to want um, a fiber twin. You're going to want your asset twin. You're going to want to understand uh, you know, a water twin if you're going to be building in any of these locations. So you want to see layers of twins. And the only way you're going to start doing this is if you start putting a stake in the ground and start understanding the physicality of the products you're building with and you know tracking the digitized workflows that and, and and keep repeating those so we can automate those and make them more sustainable, right? So look, at the end of the day, I always like to say digital waste exponentially leads to physical waste. Physical waste in the landfills, physical waste in your in in your company. You know, you're not making the money that you could be making if you have digital waste. So you have to think of that like that, that digital waste is actually insidious for a return on investment for our planet and for companies, you know, business models. Um, we're sort of coming towards the close, so I guess it'd be um, good for me to ask, what's next for Amy? What What are your uh, targets for the 
the next six, 12 months? And what, what do you hope to achieve at Symmetry, I guess? Yeah, you know, one of the reasons I came to Symmetry, aside from the culture, which I think is fantastic, is just the amazing products that we have in Symmetry Tech. So yes, we are definitely a channel partner of some of the bigger companies that are out there like Autodesk and others uh, where I came from. But Symmetry actually has amazing tech that is closing some of these gaps. And I think they're relatively, um, you know, they've been relatively quiet about it and they've been working for amazing customers. But I want to shed some light on things that like Sovelia is doing on our one-click LCA exclusive partnership on um, you know, Naviate Zero that that is now becoming and our Naviate and Allied BIM, BIM to fabrication tools. I love Arid, you know, our asset management with AI. I just think we have amazing tools that not a lot of people in the world have really heard of or seen in action and they've been in action. And, and that's what I really think, you know, people that want, you know, that we're hoping that people are listening to them and changing things. So I would say my my next six months to a year is to really shed some light on some of the amazing tools that are closing some of these gaps down to create that digital workflow, to complete those digital workflows, and to put more control in the hands of whether you're a serial owner or a, you know, a services contractor or an architect. And so I, I'm really going to, you'll see me out there, you know, getting up on the, what do they say on the soapbox, talking about some cool things. But you know, I always talk about cool things because they're cool, you know, not because somebody that I work for owns them. I just think they're really cool things. And and by the way, I'll talk about other cool things. If there are other cool things that are out there that we don't know about here at Symmetry that we want to, you know, bring into our customers, come and call, talk to me because, you know, I love to learn and, and find out what's going on. How to, I believe we're going to have to have much more of that connective tissue, that digital glue to actually do better and work smarter. So I'm I'm excited about, you know, what's coming up next and hopefully i didn't scare you richard you know we're colleagues now not just not just podcast exactly friends, but... thank you no thanks um yeah i think that's probably all we've got time for today but it's been awesome having you on um and as i said you know hopefully the start of a a long relationship as colleagues now um i love it you got to buckle up right we have to buckle up we've got to go fast we got to go quickly we've got a lot to do sounds great so thanks very much for coming on and we hope to speak to you again soon great thank you for having me